Well, hello everyone. Uh, apparently, we are now live on the internet, and to, yeah, and today we are hosting the ODI Friday lunchtime lecture right here from ODI Leeds uh, as part of the Leeds Digital Festival. So the first thing to say about Leeds Digital Festival, we've had fantastic events this week, we've got fantastic events next week, and we're really lucky to have been sponsored by IBM to be able to put on the events over these two weeks. Uh, today we are going to have talking to us from Tech Nation. He's come over from Manchester today. Henry is going to be talking about the Tech Nation report 2018. It's the latest update of a report that's been going for a number of years. He can tell us how many looking at uh, the tech industry. I'm very excited in it. Henry's done some great work on skills, which is something we're fascinated by here. Lots of stuff on businesses, innovating. Uh, I'll be very excited to hear from it. There's one note before we start. If you're on the live stream, you can ask questions. We encourage you to ask as many questions as possible, and we will put them to Henry at the end of his talk. So the way to do that is, there is a hashtag, ODI Fridays. The hashtag is ODI Fridays on Twitter. If you put your question, your thoughts, whatever you're thinking about there, we will put them to Henry. There's about 20 people here in Leeds, but we will make sure that your questions get through wherever you are in the world. So I think that's just about it. It's over to you, Henry, to tell us about Tech Nation, Wonderful. how you've improved it, and how you are making it open, which at the Open Data Institute in Leeds, we are very, very happy about. Cool. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Henry. Uh, I am a Senior Insight Manager at Tech Nation, the newly formed Tech Nation. We used to be two organizations, um, Tech City UK and Tech North. I will come on to that in a minute. Anyway, um, 30 minutes. I, my mum said I had to make it very clear what I was going to talk about over the next 30 minutes, otherwise people kind of nod off. So here's what I'm going to do and how I'm going to not make everyone bored. Um, first of all, what is the Tech Nation Report? I'm not going to be arrogant enough to assume that everyone knows what the Tech Nation Report is. Um, which some people have done about previous reports, not necessarily this one. Guiding principles of what we're trying to do, the politics of making um, a report surrounded by political animals, my political animals, um, love it. Um, how the methodology is working, what kind of like fun we've had, because there has been lots of fun with the methodology, some results and takeaways. Primarily, this is not going to be about the results, it's going to be about methods, the culture around how we kind of taken a what has been a largely kind of um, closed um, closed methods report produced in PDF and how we've basically blown that shit up, as for want of a better word. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. About Tech Nation, we are a government-backed industrial body for the tech sector in the UK. We're here to help entrepreneurs and help the digital tech sector. Um, we have a number of accelerator programs. Esme, my wonderful colleague here at the front, is um, our competitions lead. Um, and we have accelerator programs for people at all stages of the business life cycle, all the way from founders um, and kind of like two, three people bands, all the way through to, you know, the um, largest and most exciting scaling businesses in the UK. We also have a research and insights team. Um, I'm, the, I'm a data scientist, so working at Tech Nation, I get down and dirty with uh, labor market and investment data, which is uh, all my jam. Um, and we provide editorial news, that kind of thing. Um, the annual report started in 2015, and this was really seen as a state of the nation on tech in the UK. Um, and really, you know, it's, it's a benchmarking tool for many, and it beca has become highly political. Um, uh, community leaders within tech, entrepreneurs, etc., sit eagerly on the edge of their seats, waiting to see where they're going to be in this year's Set Nation report. Um, therefore, it can be quite controversial, both the methods and also the results, um, I think it's fair to say. Um, and it's... Um, it, it, it's huge. So we've got sources all the way from the Office for National Statistics all the way through to JLL, sample-based data, everything in between. So it's really quite a big beast. Um, and the objectives really are absolutely huge. Um, it's worth saying in the past, um, lots of the work has been outsourced to organizations like Nesta. 
um, RSA, those kind of people to do lots of the work. So what does analyzing the state of UK tech look like? Because that's essentially what we're trying to answer here every year. Uh, it's not really a kind of like small thing. Um, so this is a massive deal. Um, and I think this is quite a big issue. We're trying to answer, you know, a, a gazillion questions within what's actually quite a concise non-academic report. So I think that's really quite tricky. This is the kind of thing that's produced at the moment. So for instance, Leeds, I thought we were in Leeds, why not Leeds? Um, so we have a um, series of web pages um, with metrics based on all of the different places. It's very tribal, it's very like I am in this cluster and this is, uh, these are the metrics for our clusters. Um, so I started the organization uh, last year and this was before um, we um, this was, I'm sorry, I have not been involved in a Tech Nation report yet. This, yet. this is my first year. So this is what has been going on in the past. Um, so you, this is the main output for each cluster page. There is a series of metrics. Crucially, they're not all the same for each cluster, um, which makes comparison quite tricky. They're also not, you can't compare cluster by, you have to commute, go to different pages to see different clusters. Um, quite tricky again. Uh, there was one story of a um, Ernst & Young professional in Scotland who had made um, her own, she had made her own um, Tech Nation for Scotland by taking scissors and glue and cutting the Tech Nation report up. So that's kind of what we were working with. Um, which is quite tricky, and actually, the relevance of lots of these stats, I think, is a bit questionable, um, and the methods behind them. So we have two challenges here. So I, um, when I was asked to do this talk, I opened last year's report, and I looked in the front cover, and I was like, right, okay, so who are all the people involved in this report? Who are all the stakeholders? So coming up on your screen at the moment are all the different people that we're trying to keep happy when we produce this report. I mean, the UK government's like already on there. Cabinet office, I know, admittedly part of the UK government, DCMS, burning glass, blah, blah, blah. It's huge. There's absolutely loads going on there. Carrying on, this is another list of thank yous, which I'm not going to read out, but again, very, very long. So there are a lot of people to keep happy. Um, a lot of people that we are trying to work with, both in, with regards to what they might be data partners, there might be people involved in the report because they are directly funding Tech Nation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so stakeholders, stakeholders everywhere. Who are, um, it, does, it has an extra kind of dimension to it. These are the kind of questions that we're trying to uh, answer by, um, by producing the port, a report in the past. So how many digital tech workers are there in Worcester? Before I started at Tech Nation, I didn't know Worcester was a tech cluster. Um, how much grade A office space is available in Norwich? What is life like on the ground at a tech firm in Brighton? You know, these are huge, huge topics to cover and they're from all the way, they're very, very um, different uh, ends of the research spectrum. How much VC money do French tech firms receive in 2016? There is also an international comparative element to the report in the past. And crucially, how economically important is Leeds in the UK tech ecosystem? So yeah, um, something that's probably been, no doubt, been the um, subject of this week's, this week's Leeds Digital Festival. So, questions everywhere. And at this point, I think it's, it's worth saying that we were trying to answer a lot um, in the past. Um, certainly when I was trained as a market researcher, before I kind of took on a more res social research, data science role, um, this was not the approach to research you would take. You would have a kind of clearly defined set of objectives, um, a business problem, and uh, very clear methods as to how to, um, how to uh, answer that and bring some kind of conclusions to it. Um, so this was a bit overwhelming. Um, I think it was a bit overwhelming for people already at the organization as well. Um, and something we've tried to do. Um, again, objectives everywhere. So, there are two challenges here, loads of stakeholders and loads of research objectives, but really there are three. We're producing a report here, we're trying to kind of like um, uh, draw some conclusions, 
Research rigor should be at the heart of all of this, really. We should be trying to ensure something that is replicable, um, authentic, and is kind of like sourced in an open and transparent way. Um, so, a bit of a tightrope, really, when you've got those three going on in the background, I think. Um, yeah, and one that we've been, it's been a bit of a learning experience over the last few months um, for the 2018 report. Um, and there was quite, um, quite a long way to go in terms of uh, changing methodology, but it, overall it was a cultural change thing. And we really need to work on how we were going to frame the report and how we were going to change what we are seeing in 2018. So, what were our guiding principles going to be? We all came together, and I'll talk about the team in a little bit. We all came together in, um, finally, in January this year. Um, and we were like, okay, so how are we going to create something that is really kind of um, true to ourselves? So we came up with three guiding principles, which are not those. Um, they are robustness, rigor, and relevance. Um, and I will come on to why. So robustness, I think, really, really crucial to me um, and my colleagues um, was the replicability of the um, entire project. So I think that is absolutely crucial. We want to have something that um, uh, encourages people to collaborate on it as well. And I think that's... Um, so they're common data keys that allow us to mesh with other research projects. So it's all now based on open access to SICK and SOC codes, so there's standard industrial and standard occupation codes, um, travel to work areas as well, so the ONS GO keys. Um, and I think that is really, really crucial that in the future we can collaborate on pieces of work with organizations such as the ODI leads. Um, yes. Um, Clear justification for all outputs. It has seen in the past um, that we were taking data and essentially including it for the sake of it. In some cases, um, because we were just offered it and it was like, okay, well, that would be another nice thing to add, another string to our bow. Um, but there is no, I, I strongly believe, and I think we as a team are now on the same page, that if we're going to include some kind of metric or an output or some kind of visualization, there should be a clear user need for it, and it should be justified by a research objective in the first place. Um, crucially, and this will be music to many people's ears on the line and in the room, uh, data.world is being used as a repository for all data that can be legally open, um, so that is as much as possible. Um, so at the bare minimum, any kind of visualization you see, the um, top lines from that will be available within data.world. There are a few caveats to that, which I'll come on to in a minute, but they are mainly to do with the Office for National Statistics. Um, rigor, right. So if we have a robust methodology going in, rigorous research comes out. Um, so the sources must be... Um, we have done a lot of work this year working with data partners and with the ONS to ensure that we are... Um, Sourcing the most high quality and innovative um, data available. There is a good mixture of sampled and population based data, um, internet, and kind of like face to face captured. Um, and I think that has really, they've really complemented each other very well. Um, and they, are, they provide a really good breadth of, um, of scope within the report. Um, there is a clear, this is something that I found particularly upsetting actually, when I first um, moved to the organization last year, was the lack of um, a clear, well-documented methodology. Um, upsetting, God, it's bigger things in the world. But anyway, uh, I did find it upsetting. Um, was the, uh, kind of, uh, there isn't a paper trail, necessarily, or kind of like clear, documented, right, this is what we did, X, Y, Z. Um, and it has made this year slightly tricky, I think it's fair to say, um, because we have been having to unpick bits of work and trying to create, say, a time series based on previous data wasn't possible. So we have had to build from the ground up once more. Um, and again, open data in all legally possible cases, um, which I will come on to. Um, it needs to be relevant. Um, so. Gross value added, GVA, is a very common figure used by policymakers, government. However, to an entrepreneur, for instance, it is borderline meaningless. Um, it is not particularly helpful. It's very much a macroeconomic metric that is used as an output to kind of benchmark places, say Leeds to Manchester, etc. Um, 
and is not particularly useful for entrepreneurs. Um, so we're really trying to create something that is useful. Um, so we always hear that the two biggest issues facing well, UK businesses generally is talent and investment. Um, so a lot of work with my wonderful colleague Lucy at the front has been looking at how we can um, provide some insight into labour markets and investment markets in the UK rather than providing um, simple metrics which are not very useful. Um, actual recommendations um, and then the look and feel, the output itself, I will show you in a second but uh, we have moved away from the PDF and onto a completely web-based JavaScript front end. So, how do we make this happen? So, this is the tune by Orange Juice, rip it up and start again apparently. So, we didn't quite do that. Um, but however, we did start with a brand new team, apart from Francesca, my colleague up there, who was previously working at the organization. So, we were brought in, um, how many of us are there? There are six. Um, we were brought in, over the course of about the last 12 months um, to really um, solidify an insight offering from Tech Nation um, and to become a kind of um, the go-to source for um, insight, intelligence and data on tech in the UK. So at the top we have George Windsor who um, is our insights lead. Um, he used to be at Nesta and also worked on the report in the past. Um, he is very pro uh, open data and is methodology king, which is very useful to have. Uh, we have Francesca over there who's working with all our data partners, um, going across the UK, um, case studies, and trying to get people on side because that can be quite tricky. Um, Sarah, who is a data science intern, also ex of Nesta, you can see a theme here. Um, Lucy at the front, who is um, a wonderful colleague, Lucy, who um, uh, graduated from Code First Girls and um, Kale is now working for us as a data design intern doing all sorts of fun things with JavaScript and visualization. Myself and Safa who is our I suppose almost scrum lead we're treating this entire thing as a product build so whereas in the past you were looking at it as a um, as a uh, as, as kind of like standalone research project where data was captured um, and then you basically ship it off to the graphic design team. That's not how this has worked whatsoever. I'll come on to the process shortly. However, it's, we have very much went into a discovery phase. We've spent, there was a very clear process of how we've all worked together. For instance, I kind of sit between the data procurement and the data visualization. I do a bit of both. Sarah is very much on the data procurement. George is the methodology. Lucy over here is very much the visualization, so the outputs at the back end. So it has been treated. We have had a, a backlog. Um, we've had a Kanban board, and it's, it's worked to dream, and it's allowed us to very clearly justify each output to an objective as well. Um, we've also had full ownership of the methodology this year. Um, which, hurrah, we are very pleased about. Um, we've been able to fully document what's going on um, and justify everything. Um, so yeah, we have daily stand-ups. Um, we provide aut autonomy within the team. Um, it was very much a work in process, but um, I think we've worked brilliantly together. We have staff in Manchester, Sheffield, and London. Um, and we meet up probably, I probably meet up once a week, once every other week. Um, yeah, we really support each other. Um, it's really lovely working in a team where you've got kind of like autonomy in your specialist skills. So you are the specialist in your area. You are trusted to go and empowered, is probably a better word, to go and uh, create something brilliant, um, which has been a joy to work in. So, data procurement in the past, um, sorry, I'm just gonna get a bit of water. Um, in the past, um, again, has been outsourced quite a lot. So, um, last year, um, lots of the data came from the Office of National Statistics, as you would imagine. Um, not in-house, we used a mixture of Frontier Economics and Nesta before I arrived. Um, which was tricky, because you had no control over um, what was actually happening um, and what you were going to be um, creating. You weren't necessarily sure of um, the authenticity. 
Um, and it was also bloody expensive, um, to be quite frank. Um, so this year, things have been different. I um, trained to go into the Secure Research Service or the, the, um, the virtual micro laboratories that used to be uh, known um, with the ONS, um, the Death Cube, um, as Tom was calling it before, which is kind of like a closed room, no internet access, no mobile phone, et cetera, et cetera, coding away and um, querying the business structure database, amongst others. Um, that has been really, really useful. Um, it's meant, I know you always say qualitative research, got to get close to the data. Well, I was close to the quant data. I, that was really, really fun. And I think I processed probably 30 million rows. So that was a, that was a good, fun experience, um, even if I did need some human contact afterwards. Um, so yeah, um, the ONS, the SRS um, was, um, yeah, going into the lab was an interesting experience. Um, there's um, a whole heap of stuff, the amount of potential there, and if anyone has done it or is thinking about doing it, I like empower, I, I strongly promote going and doing it because it's a bit of a hard slog going into the data lab, um, but you do genuinely get some really, particularly the business structure database is an invaluable source. It's all based on um, PAY, it's, it's based on HMRC data, basically, and tax returns from, um, from companies. Um, and there's a complete audit of the UK. Of course, there are some issues with it, but there are issues with every data source. Um, so yeah, crucially as well, so we, create, we created this team, um, and we created this brand new team. Um, we want to be retaining these technical skills internally. We want to be retaining um, you know, wonderful people like Lucy. Um, so, and rather than just shipping 20K out to an external organization now, we want to be retaining those skills inside um, and actually eating our own dog food. Like we are promoting kind of like positive talent and skills practice in the tech world. We should be doing this ourselves. Um, I think that was um, a real game changer this year. Um, we've also brought all of the, um, the product developments, the visualization this year completely in house. Um, allows it to be bespoke. It's not a case of, right, okay, I've got a whole load of tables now, ship that off to the graphic designer and hey presto, we're done. Um, the end user is completely at the heart of it, so we have designed visualizations based on the wants of the end user. Um, there are all links to data.world, um, so that all of the repos with all the data available can then be used and they're replicable. Again, saves on money. So I, I think um, the budget has been completely changed this year. Um, for the better, very much so. So, this is our kind of like overall workflow. Research objectives defined, so that was a kind of um, early, late last year, data procurement, product development, and we've got to ensure that this data is accessible. We want this to be as open as possible, people to be able to build on it, and for things to be accessible. Um, so, what are we creating? So, the structure, sorry, I will stop doing that. The structure. <laughs> I'll start doing that. The structure. Uh, we have got um, five clear areas of focus. Um, and there was quite a, long, a lot of work went into this. So international competitiveness. Um, the role of the UK is changing in tech. I'll come on to that in a minute. But like, not only Bre Brexit seems to have accelerated something, but there is a changing dynamics in world tech. Um, and uh, we are, th there is certainly work to be done to ensure to maintain the UK's position uh, in the world. Um, very interesting second output, looking at collaboration, connectivity, and culture. So that is really the underlying framework of um, what is driving uh, innovation, in particular, within tech in the UK. Meetups, events, um, kind of GitHub data, all of that kind of stuff, programming language trends, that kind of thing. Jobs and skills, so as you'd imagine, that is a crucial thing. I would say it's probably the biggest crisis facing tech in the UK at the moment, is the jobs and skills crisis, um, particularly with Brexit on the horizon and the potential for tier two visas to become the norm. Um, digital tech businesses, um, that is a core of ONS data that is really looking at where the tech businesses are in the UK, their turnover and their GVA. And then, Output five, which is the survey, which we have always done. Um, it's a very good method of trying to get some verbatim, some um, personal testimony from digital leaders in the UK, because this is ultimately about them. Um, so yeah, that is how we have put it all together. 
all the metrics that are produced in all of those five outputs are relevant, or at least I think they are. Um, they're all relevant, they are all things that can be used um, in an actual manner to make kind of policy decisions or a business decision, crucially, where shall I set up shop, that kind of thing. Um, they all have a relevant data.world link, so people can go, oh, right, that's really cool, I want to go and have a bit of that, and they can go and play to their heart's content. Um, we didn't just take loads of data and add it all together, which is, I think, what has happened in the past. We've ensured that there is clear rationale for all of its inclusion, um, and also a clear methodology as to how it got there. So, our data sources for this year. The business structure database, which is great, if anyone has um, ever used it. Um, so, yeah. Then we go on to the annual business survey, the annual population survey. So, obviously, they are sample-based, um, and there are a few... There are a few issues about low counts and also um, about how representative they are, I think, of the entire population. Um, they're both conducted annually, and I think they're very good for very top-line um, results. I think if you're really trying to get into the nitty-gritty of a certain area, you're probably better off looking at a different source. Um, ASH, the Annual Survey of Hours and Earnings, again, um, survey-based, sample-based, um, with a few issues, but that has, that has all been procured from the data laboratory in Pimlico. Fun of all fun. Second, public API. So, Meetup, Eventbrite, Adzuna, and GitHub. We've tried to use um, open data as much as possible. These are brilliant sources, um, and we've actually been able to make some really quite beautiful things out of them, um, and things that people could then go and DIY it and do it themselves. Startup Genome have also provided us some data um, from international comparison, um, and the survey. So, there we go. Um, this was a really big exercise. Um, I think I spent about a month in the data laboratory, um, and it was at times a bit soul-destroying, but it was very much, very much worth it. And this is really kind of like, you've got to realize the scale of what we're trying to achieve. You know, what is UK tech? What are we trying to do here? So, data.world, if you haven't um, ever been on the data.world website, it's brilliant. I think until I like, last checked, they are still sponsoring these Friday lectures. Don't know if they still are. I don't know. Okay, it's great. Data.world's brilliant. It's a bit like GitHub for data. Um, version control of data sets, big, big amounts of collaboration, and um, tie-ins to all your favorite programming languages. So R, Python, I think there's probably some things to do with JavaScript on there as well. Um, or BI tools like Tableau, Power BI, that kind of thing. It is open. It is accessible. It's a great tool. Go and use it. It's free. Um, so, I mean, I love PDFs. Um, I don't really. Um, so, this year, um, we um, have decided to move away from PDFs. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've quite inaccessible. Um, they're a day to nightmare. There's this website, if anyone wants to go on it. Um, Tom Forth is part of um, a group championing the uh, abolition of PDFs within open data. Um, and yeah, when I, when I arrived last year and I, I saw that this, uh, we got so much information and it was all in PDF form, like that was, it was really a missed opportunity. Um, and I think we're really trying to change that this year, ensure that there is um, data that is kind of like useful for the end need, uh, end user need. Um, yeah. So, tech is our friend. Um, we have a JavaScript um, front end, um, uh, so using a variety of charting APIs, um, D3 and the like. Um, they all render browser side, which is really, really useful because they are nice, clean, quick, and it's not as though you click a button and then it spins around. You don't get the circle of death for ages. Um, they're hugely customizable. Lucy has been amazing. Um, completes amazeballs and has produced some absolutely amazing products for us to have on the front end and make this really quite an inspiring piece of work to look at. Um, so this is the kind of thing we've got. Um, here we're looking at kind of like different um, tech clusters across the world. This is a network diagram of all meetups in the UK. Well, it's the 400 largest clustered 
based on the topics that underlie them. So this is kind of open source cluster here. You've got a, got to remember them all now, uh, it's a kind of um, data science, AI, and it's the orange, the green, it's a kind of ways of working. The black, I can't remember. Anyway, there's, uh, there's 11 of those, one for each cluster in the UK. You can also fully download all of the data, all of the nodes of vertices data, and do your own thing with it, run a different algorithm on it, that kind of thing. Um, again, international comparison, digital density, looking at location quotients based on um, turnover. In a minute, very shortly, I'm going to talk about the, um, a few of the results. Um, so we'll be able to see what's going on there. I will let people have a play with those afterwards. I'm conscious of the time. Um, so yeah, data.world, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, and our open data journey, um, yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, it was a bit of a tricky cultural challenge. So we started with, yeah, open data is great. What if we can't control this story is what some people said internally. Um, what if we're wrong? Um, and it's, it's really hard. Um, I, I, th I think, so when I first, when we first put to our senior management team that we're thinking of making the data open, this is the kind of face we got. <laughs> um, like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? This is like, you know, a potential kind of professional suicide, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we won them round. So how to make people um, culturally, an organization that isn't particularly au fait with open data, how to get them on side. Well, make Gavin Starks your best mate was the first thing that we did. Um, he came and did a project with us, um, uh, with our senior management team as well, um, and me and him managed to win the case as to why we should um, be having open data. No, but honestly, um, slowly does it. When you're trying to convince, uh, we were trying to convince our senior management team and stakeholders, um, cultural, ta 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 sorry, cultural change takes time, um, particularly when there isn't a strong culture of it internally. Obviously, publicly open sounds great. It's what does that actually mean in practice? Um, there is a progressive move to open. Um, the fact that this place exists in Leeds is kind of like testament to that. Um, and I really honestly think, I really try to push this forward. Like, our reputation will gain from this. Um, there have obviously been naysayers about Tech Nation in the past, and one of the, one of the criticisms has been about the openness of the data. So this is a real means of kind of like encouraging people who have in the past been quite negative about it, get involved. We are now making this open and available to all. Also, it's not the end of the world if it's wrong. I mean, obviously, we're trying to strive for it not to be wrong. Uh, Paul always says to me, if it's wrong, like, you just, like, move on. Like, yeah, thanks for making it better. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not a kind of proud kind of guy. I think you've got to take yourself not too seriously as well uh, when it comes to all of this. So, what we created, um, I will, again, these are the key findings. Um, this is a bit death by words, but crucially, Talent and skills is still a cru um, crucial problem in the UK. Um, tech does not only reside in cities. So we've got this kind of idea of tech as being young people, working in Shoreditch, wearing trendy cool clothes and that kind of thing. That is not the case. There is lots of tech in places like Reading, Bracknell, the Wet 4 Corridor, Stevenage, um, boring suburbs of Edinburgh, that kind of thing. That, that, that is really where the economic powerhouses of tech in the UK. Um, and I think we really need to um, show that. There is only one area in the UK where tech workers, on average, are under the age of 35, and that's East London. You know, a complete misconception that tech workers are young and um, are university leavers, primarily. Um, so yeah, digital suburbs, big deal. So I want to thank the ODI leads for having me here. Thank ODI HQ for inviting me to do this. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks everyone who's watching. Remember, 
ODI Fridays hashtag, you can ask questions on there and then Amy will ask them later. But first, the people who made it here, we are well over 20 now, about 25, it's fantastic. They get to ask the first question. So, who has a question? Don't go and get too comfortable, Henry. All right, okay. <laughs> One minute break, that is it. Uh, who has questions for Henry? Oh, we've got two straight away. Okay. If you could just give a very short introduction for who you are for the live stream and use the mic so that people on the internet can hear us. Uh, hello, my name's Richard Barlow. I'm from... Is it top? Yeah. 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 Uh, my name's Richard Barlow. There, I'm from Leeds City Council. Uh, one of the points you made on there was, a key point for me was about uh, retention of skills within your team. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you went about that? Mm -hmm. Please. Um, of course. So... Um, one of the big things, well, the main source of kind of like current skills data in the UK at the moment has come from Adzuna, who are um, an aggregator of uh, labour market data from across the web. Um, and we have been analysing, crucially, jobs, uh, job, sorry, labour demand data. Um, so real-time requirements for skills in different areas of the UK. Um, and trying to look crucially at the nuances, so where there is the most demand for junior, senior, mid-level mid developers or people at all, the, all kind of occupations throughout tech, um, and crucially programming languages and where that is. Um, and I think that the data that they offer is very interesting. One of the, always one of the issues with talent skills, particularly with the ONS, is the currency of it, so how... Um, if you look at the annual survey of hours and earnings, it's two years old. Um, so we've tried to look at something really innovative, looking at real-time data from um, online job ads. I still think the holy grail is to get some supply-side data, so what is coming through our schools, our universities, um, and that is something that we, it's, this is all kind of like striving and work in progress. That's something that we really want to do in the future. We're also doing other work on talent and skills alongside this project and taking a, job to, a, a data set of every single job ad in the north of England from the last three years, um, which is also very exciting. We should speak about that afterwards. Fantastic. Who's next? Hi, Henry. Hey, Kane. Is there anything that really... Wait, 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 wait. We know who you are, Kane. <laughs> But the internet does, not everyone on the internet does yet. Ah, apologies. Um, I'm Kane uh, from Tech Nation. <laughs> Is there anything that surprised you in a really positive or negative way throughout this whole journey you've been on? Um, yeah, so there, is, there are two sides. From the data size, um, the thing that has surprised me the most is dispelling long, long held um, preconceptions about tech, the age, the location, um, that kind of thing has been genuinely like exciting and really, really insightful. Um, from an internal point of view, one of the things that surprised me the most is just how well it actually all fell into place once we made a commitment going open. Um, we had a really clear team, clear team structure, a clear product build, and a clear kind of like um, a clear objective to aspire to. Um, and the six of us worked together brilliantly, um, and there was no, there's been no wavering actually on the openness internally. Um, it has been down to justifications with the methodology, um, and what this will mean for the organisation once we publish it. Fantastic. Any more, or are we going over to Twitter? You look like you had a question earlier, Lorna. You look like you were tempted. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. So, over to you, Amy, if there's any questions on there. Uh, we've got just uh, one so far. Oh, so this fantastic. Is from uh, Leeds Citizen well, on Twitter. Well, what a surprise to see him asking a question. <laughs> um, how much of the data you collate and the code you write to analyse it are you going to make open? So, the data that we... What was the first part that we're going to... Sorry, could you just repeat the question? <laughs> how, much, how much of the data you collate and then the code you also write to analyse it are you making open? So the data, everything that you see, all the top lines that you see on a screen, so the numbers within a bar chart, etc., that as standard will all be open. Um, Non-ONS sources, we will make the open data set, 
bit full granular, open as much as we possibly can. Start up genome, there is a slight issue with that as well. Um, and for instance, the network diagram, you will be able to pull off an uh, entire granular data set of all the nodes, all the vertices, and all one and a half million rows of the colors and all that kind of stuff. In terms of the code, um, that, that was definitely an icing on the cake thing. We've, definitely, we've been trying to do that. Um, lots of the code that I personally have written um, in Python and in R has been in the ONS, in the data lab. Um, there is a clearance process for that to come out. That's certainly something that we can do and I would like to do. It will not be something that we will be able to do by launch on the 16th of May. But watch this space, basically. Fabulous. If there's no more questions, I'm going to ask one. But then Paul gets in first, then I'll ask one. Otherwise, it's going to be me. So get in with your questions. You've got about mm, two or three minutes to get them in. ODI Fridays, hashtag, get some good questions in. Hi, hi Henry. Uh, Paul Connell from ODI Leeds. What will the Tech Nation report look like when it's published? OK. Um, so we are going to have, there is going to be a PDF report. 15 pages of very condensed, um, small prose um, results from the research. Um, that's been produced for a number of reasons. Um, government, um, some people just prefer holding something. Um, it's also a driver to get people onto the website because throughout it, it's saying, go to this bit of the website to find more about your cluster. Crucially, we do not have much cluster information in there. So if you want to find out about Leeds, for instance, you need to open your laptop. Online, it will, be, it will be all segregated into the five areas of focus, so international through to community perceptions, as I showed throughout the, um, the deck. Um, there will then be individual cluster pages, again, for you to be able to look at your own cluster in depth. But crucially, the five outputs will all have um, cartograms and maps on them, so you can regionally compare, so you can compare Leeds to um, Manchester. All of the geographies mainly, mainly been broken down by travel to work area, so they are kind of like meaningful geography polygons within the UK, um, which are all based on census data. So the Leeds travel to work area, I think it's got about 600,000 people in it, something like that. Um, it has 70% of the people here live and work in the Leeds travel to work area. Um, so they are not arbitrary, they are genuine clusters of people in the UK. They're not perfect, but they are, they are clusters of people in the UK. Fantastic. We've got one more, which is fortunate because Paul asked my question. <laughs> so we've just had another one come through uh, from Twitter. So this is from uh, Hannah Folds from ODI HQ. Ooh, exciting. Um, so how can we better connect people across the UK to share best practice on using and working with open data and to spread the skills? And to spread the skills, right, mm, okay. So two questions in one, Henry. How do well, how I, would, that I would yeah. How do we spread the skills? Well, I would start with that saying, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a data scientist or whatever, I don't really know. I, I call myself a data scientist, I don't really know what to call it. I do algorithms and write code. I've made the entire thing up, like completely from day one. Um, so that question is very timely, um, and I certainly felt a bit lost. Um, I think it was probably only my arrogance that got me to where I am now, to be honest, <laughs> in many ways. Anyway, um, so I think, well, open is best always because it allows people a kind of a playground, essentially, to try and replicate work and build on it themselves. Um, forget the jargon. Um, I, for a long time, was worried about asking the wrong question or that kind of thing. Um, and I think things like jargon um, can really um, make it a bit tricky. Um, I think there is a lot of work to be done with alternative skills providers as well to try and ensure that um, at present, whilst education isn't quite up to scratch for trying to make um, these kind of careers possible, um, mainstream that is, alternative skills providers are there to be able to pick up the, um, those that want to be involved. Did that answer the question? I realised that was quite a, yeah, okay, cool, thank you. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, and it doesn't seem like there are, I think we can, more or less, call it a day, but one moment first, just to thank again IBM and Lorna over there who have sponsored 
these events all through the week and all next week at ODI Leeds as part of Leeds Digital Festival and also Data.World who sponsor the ODI Fridays whole weekly podcast and video that you're watching to and they got a big plug anyway because you use Data.World mm. throughout mm. the report. So uh, that'll be the end of it. Thanks again, Henry, for coming to talk to us. And Thank thanks for me. watching. Yeah, yeah.